Sharon Stone, what can you say? Our, you're going to be listening to her in 22 seconds, depending yeah. on how long we go. You wish. It'll be way longer. Sharon Stone, uh, you know, just... Did a, my first movie with the lovely Sharon Stone. She was perfectly wonderful on it. Uh, we didn't have a lot of scenes together, but we stayed in the same apartment complex. Every time I see her, I bore the shit out of her with that story. And I thought I saw her at the Oscar at a thing, um, and I went hunting for her. I wanted to say hi to her. And she's always fun, upbeat, and very much a movie star, and sort of kind of old school movie star. Just really pretty from, from basic instinct on, actually from Total Recall on, always followed what mm -hmm. she did. She's very interesting to talk to. I mean, she mentioned Humphrey Bogart. You know, it was the first time we kind of dove into Humphrey Bogart, the way his suits were tailored. So she meanders in a lot of different directions. Yeah. She's a painter that has shows all over mm -hmm. the world. She's been an iconic figure in American cinema. We'll talk a lot about Casino and what's the difference between acting with Joe Pesci mm -hmm. and Robert De Niro. Oh, that's right. There is. Well, a you're not. If you're driving your car, you're going, boy, I'm not pulling over. I'm going yeah, to listen to this Stick one. it out. It's uh, great. She's charming, smart, and um, quite a delight. It's one so of the few hosts to that to took her. a pee break. <laughs> she says, am I allowed to take a pee break? And David said, no. And I said, no, 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 come on. I said, uh, you're the no. only host to do it, but let's do it. And she hosted SNL too. Uh, she was such a good twice? sport. And we talk about the, the comedy that we did in, in 1992 oh, right. with Sharon Stone. We would be literally arrested now. So she was a good sport about it. But that was 1992. You know what? Someone would have come out of the audience and done a citizen's cancel. Yeah. Just hold you till the cops come to cancel you. It was, uh, it's, it was, uh, but she was uh, so good in it. Yeah. She said, well, anyway, listen to this podcast. It's really interesting. I enjoyed it. Here she is. Hi. Long time I haven't seen you. How are you? I know. Why do you look the same and I look like I belong in an old folks home? <laughs> we are getting old, aren't we? It's incredible. Sharon thought I was Nick Nolte when she jumped on. That's true. I did. I you do that. have a, a Nolte sort of from Prince of Tides, though, or from... Jesus, Bridget. You need a little That's... bit more of that shag cut into the top of your hair to be Nick Nolte. Did you know that Nick Nolte and Mickey Rourke are best friends? Well, I got to say, they're both unbelievably nice men. I know both of them quite well. I worked with um, Nick, which was fantastic. I did a movie with Nick and Jeff Bridges. It was wonderful. And then uh, a Sam Shepard film. And then Mickey, I've known forever. I went to Russia with with um, Mickey to to help raise money for a children's oncology ward. And Mickey and his best friend went out and got a Santa suit and bought presents for every kid in the ward. And he, he's just so kind. Mickey's such a kind man. And so crazy, brilliant. The wrestler he did, you know, a few years yeah. back. Not the, the kind of a next level type of acting. Nicolas Cage, you know, in the early days, they all wanted to be friends with Mickey. Yeah. And so Nicolas Cage wanted to be friends. He'd be like, yeah, I'll come over. And he said that Mickey Rourke would always have him go to like the store on the way over there. Hey, could you give me some orange juice? <laughs> It's Nick, funny. <laughs> he's so, so nice. Nick is a fabulous actor, too. Wow. Nicky Nolte, yeah. No, he's Nick amazing. Cage, he'll make these incredible, oh, strange movies, and no matter what he does, they're so fascinating. Pig was fabulous. I don't know if you saw that. It was about... I about yes, I did see it. Ooh. He is, he he doesn't believe in realism. He he. I did a movie with him once. He goes, in this next take, I'm going to do... Daniel Day-Lewis from The Name of the Father. But the movie had nothing. It was a comedy, nothing to do with that. So he came in and he just dropped to his knees. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> he is the most eccentric, the funniest guy ever. But he's 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 uh, got all these cool character parts he's doing lately that are so brilliant. Just oh. quirky movies. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Who was you when you were a, a little girl? I just, I, I like to do Oprah stuff. Like who were the actors or actresses that you went, holy shit, or the movies that you saw? Yeah. That you I was went, obsessed what? with Humphrey Bogart. 
He was the greatest, greatest, greatest actor. And he was so cool. And his suit jackets always fit really well. <laughs> um, the back of his suit jackets fit really beautifully around his waist and his bum, oh. tailored so beautifully. Like someone knew how to like really fit his clothes. And I thought Spencer Tracy was really so um he had such a great way of expressing his tenderness in a very quiet way he had such a such quality where you really felt like you could trust him somehow he had something where he let you open up to the characters he played and i really like that do you know what's in uh, my uh my Wife and I. I always, I always go by movies you you will revisit, and so guess guess who's coming to dinner? It's become a thing that we see once um, a year now. Yeah. And Spencer Tracy, if you know, the, his speech at the end, uh, you know, just cut you in half uh, to to about the love of Sidney Poitier, and you know, Sidney Poitier, man, by great. the way, what well, a let's... phenomenal human being, and I had the great joy and pleasure of being friends with Sidney and. You know, he gave me a lot of advice over the years and what a good man. Just what a, wow. Elegant, elegant man. Just to watch him walk. Elegant, there was just a, elegant just soul. Gentle. Yeah. The great wisdom about life and a great understanding about life. And I know. I got to make him laugh once. I did these events for Cedar sinai Heart stuff and uh, I would do like my little shtick. And then he stopped me and I was so nervous to be around him. And he's, I've seen you many times. And he gave me a compliment. So I said, I used to do you. So I, all I could think of was, they call me Mr. Tibbs, which was 1968 or something. It's unbelievable <laughs> in that movie he, with Rod Stein. Yeah. He was so- Oh yeah, in the heat of the night. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, I had the also the privilege of working with Rod Steiger earlier in my career. And, you know, he was tough. He wasn't fooling around, man. And he put you through your paces on set. I mean, he was a tough dude. And, you know, I'm sure he wasn't easy on Sydney either. Yeah, whatever chemistry they had, I think it's one of the seminal moments in film history is when I believe Sydney Poitier slaps some white Southern guy. Back. Yeah, he slaps the sheriff when the sheriff slaps him, yeah. slaps him back. Yeah. And that was like, whoa. Phenomenal. Yeah. You who who haven't you worked with? Or yeah, I was about to say. I haven't worked with some of the, like I haven't worked with Javier Bardem, who is someone I would like to work with. Um, I haven't well, worked with a lot of these like new directors, and I would really like to do that. Um, I say new; they're probably not so new, but they're new <laughs> since since my yeah. spree in the nineties. You know, uh, yeah. there's you a know, lot. These Great young people now that are really exciting, you know. Um, who, but do you, who do you think? Sh Shalif Labeef or, no, sorry. Uh, Shia Labeouf. Shia, sorry. It's sorry, Shia Labeouf. I'm sorry, a great actor. I am, uh, I, well, I like, I think Shia Labeouf is, is actually very, very talented. And I think. Tremendous. Yes. I think he's really, really intelligent. And I think that his intelligence is probably a bit high for our occupation. And I think that people don't always understand. <laughs> yeah. I think the opera yeah. that he did, the Shia LaBeouf opera was mm -hmm. so brilliant. And that some of these things that he does are probably just a little over the head of some of the people that are looking at him. You know, I had the opportunity to sit next to him one night at an event and he was just, a, he's a brilliant human being. Um, and I see this with some actors that people don't understand. Sometimes they're just super smart. Well, like me, but you know, with, with Shia LaBeouf, I think he comes out in Transformers and people just think he's going to have sort of a cookie cutter situation career that they could predict. And he does something a little beyond that and beyond that every time. And people don't quite get it. And they, they're like, wait, what are you doing? And 
He should be allowed to do all that well, what, because it's very cool. Can I ask you both a question? What was the name of the movie where it was about his childhood and his dad was a stage dad? And that's such mm -hmm. a heartbreaking movie. And if that is autobiographical, you can see where all his his well, stuff it's comes interesting from. Interesting, because I would I just saw a little clip of William Defoe talking about how all actors are scared, and if they're not scared, they don't give a shit. And Frankly, I don't think that's really true. And I think that Shia LaBeouf is one of them that isn't scared. And he also isn't that he doesn't give a shit. I think that he grew up with so much terror that like this thing that he does now expressing the truth of his imagination is probably the most freeing and lacks such severe consequences that he is able to go beyond some of the things that people who haven't been through what he's been through can can ascertain and can can get to, you know. Yeah, he has that quality. Like you feel like he needs to do this. You know, yes. it's medicinal. It's not yes. like a just a career. It's an art. It's his vocation. Yeah, yeah. right. Art. And yeah. I think for many of us who just keep going, it's because it really is our vocation. Being an artist really is. Our vocation. It's not just a job, you know. In the beginning, I thought, oh, you're supposed to take all these parts because, you know, came from a very blue collar family. And I thought, well, that's what jobs are. Yeah. You're supposed to just work. I didn't mm -hmm. really understand that we were actually allowed to be our whole self as an artist. You know, that's not something that anybody talks to you about when you start becoming an actor, that you should express yourself fully, especially yeah. for a woman. They're like, and shut the fuck up. It, <laughs> it's, it's personal. It's not like switching jobs at a department store. It, it's it's not any complaint. It's, it, it's a glamorous profession to, to the outsiders. But when you're in something that really sucks and you know you're going down with the ship yes. and the bullets, you're out in front of the bullets yes. and you go to the dailies and you go, oh, this... It sucks. It's a horrible. And, and I always shit. knew that meant I was going to be the one selling it because all the male stars <laughs> were going to abandon ship and Sharon yes. was selling this one. <laughs> yeah. And it would be called Sharon Stone's whatever, like as if it, you were the director, the producer, the writer. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's it's. Did you uh, run into a lot of uh, macho men in the 80s that treated women not very well? <laughs> 80s There's and 90s. no way. 80s, was, 90s, I, I mean, I yesterday. don't know. It's. Was it <laughs> yeah, piggish of men? Of no, I know. I'm kidding. I mean, but when I, when I started working, the rules were very different. You know, people were taking their penises out in the makeup trailer <laughs> and doing coke off the back of the makeup mirrors. And hookers were coming to the set and drug dealers and all of that. A lot of coke. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you're old enough to remember this stuff. Oh, I remember. I, 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 would, I, I would hear men in a room talk about women with such contempt mm -hmm. together. It, uh -huh. it, it kind of shocked me because I had like a rough childhood. I didn't like the way my dad treated my mom and I didn't come from that place. But yeah, there's a lot of anger Ooh. toward women. It's yeah. like, whoa, whoa, where is this coming from? Yeah. So you, obviously you went through the gauntlet. And, and it's a lot of the brunt of that anger. Because if you're a woman that no. starts to get any power at all, like shut up, <laughs> you know. They, you started... Producing, co-producing, production company, you're taking the reins yeah. of your career. And they're like, Sharon, you're doing really well, but we still want you to shut up. Do you understand? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And 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 I heard really recently, like as recently as a few weeks ago, a statement about me, which was nobody likes a loud mouth broad. <laughs> Did you just think that was about you or was it about <laughs> so, it was a direct it was directly to about me and oh, I, Jesus you know so uh, Harvey Weinstein gave an interview or <laughs> from prison <laughs> Yes it and I and I get it I get it I really get it cuz um I am a loudmouth broad and and I get it I get I really do understand it Before you, who who tried to take the reins away from the men and who, who pushed back like you? And you of our generation was probably the first and also were, was in this spectacular global kit, which gave you so much power. Um, but was were there anyone before you that you looked to? Was Catherine Hepburn pretty 
tough in a way you wouldn't take? You know, she made her own production company, which was so unheard of. Betty Davis made her own production company, which was really, Lucy. really unheard of. Lucy. Lucy, who I actually met and got to put on stage a couple of times early when I was doing events. Um, I got to be the wing person that got to put her on stage. <laughs> so I met some really interesting people from that old guard and you know it was i mean it's it's not nice to say that these women were battle axes it's a weird expression but they had had all their way through i mean hardcore battling it and they wore that battle you know it wasn't it wasn't easily won anything that any of those women did well, sure. you you came through, which is slightly different from I would say there, uh, as a sex symbol, what, whatever you want to call it. So when you were exploding, you also were a sex symbol and a mm -hmm. woman. It was a, it was a it was a different lane than previous. There might have been other beautiful women, but you were the first that I think played essentially got a Golden Globe or it could have been Academy Award nomination for Basic Instinct, and also being very very a beautiful young woman. Um, so were you the first <laughs> in that way to explode in a movie as the co-lead with Michael Douglas? I think no one was really ready for what happened with that movie. You know, it, it, it was tough to make that film. We had a lot, a lot of resistance, um, a lot of resistance in the street, a lot of resistance everywhere. Um, I, I mean, resistance within there, there was just it was a hard movie to get made it was a hard movie to make it was a hard movie to finish um my name wasn't even you know on the poster you know i was not it was a michael douglas movie it was michael douglas basic instinct and i was on the poster but not my name which ultimately worked out to be quite beneficial for me because people were like who's the girl right you know, who's that girl? Jeez, she's all through that movie. Who's that girl? And it Did you audition? Did you have to I, audition a bunch? Of, who did you beat out? I auditioned for uh, eight and a half months. And Ooh. I was the 13th woman that they offered the film to. They didn't offer it to me right away. Um, I had to wait for 13 other more important actresses to turn it down. And many, they really wanted Michelle Pfeiffer. They didn't want me. Um, but she turned it down and they kept going back to her and she kept turning it down, thankfully. And they offered it to just a ton of different people that weren't me. And I just kept hanging in there and I kept screen testing and I kept auditioning for over eight months. Wow. You know, it's smart. You didn't say, fuck this. I'm not, it's now it's getting humiliating. I'm going to walk away. You just stayed, stayed, stayed. No, I did it. that for casino too. I mean, they saw. Every showgirl in Vegas, they saw tons and tons and tons of actresses. And by the time Casino came around, I was like, I am not going to line up with showgirls. And I am not going to line up with the other 3,000 actresses. And I finally just said, no, I'm not coming in till you get down to serious casting and I'm done being yanked around in the business. I really want this part and I'm really right for it. And when you get to real casting, let me know. Wow. I mean, it just so shows you because you've done Total Recall before Basic Instinct. Sure. Paul, and then, you know, and then you've done many other movies. So, yeah, just you're always auditioning in Hollywood. It never Wasn't really Total ends. Recall really big? It just, I mean, it can't compete with, I guess, Basic Instinct, but Total Recall, in my recollection, was huge. It was big and I was famous for a few months and then it kind of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's it what was, happened. It buys you six more months in the business. Yeah. It was like, okay, you did that. And then mm -hmm. one, but it did hold enough power to get me the part uh, in Basic Instinct. Shit. Wow. So then here you are in your career, Basic Instinct goes crazy. And then you get a call from Lorne Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I think Lauren is a wonderful person. I mean, you guys have much closer relationships with him, quite obviously, than I do. But he <clears throat> personally saved my life. You know, I came to do Saturday Night Live with you guys. Um, 
which I was so excited to do and scared, really scared. And I came out to do the monologue live, which is always <laughs> super scary. And oh, yeah. um, a bunch of people started uh, storming the stage saying they were going to kill me during the opening monologue. And the um, the police that are always in there during all that and the security that's always in there froze because they'd never seen anything like that happen. And they sort of, they froze. And Lauren started screaming, what are you guys doing watching the fucking show? And Lauren started beat himself, beating up and pulling these people back from the stage. And the stage manager looked at me and went, hold for five. And I thought he meant five minutes. <laughs> And he meant five <laughs> seconds. And so all these people were getting beat up and handcuffed right in front of me. And we went live. And I was doing this live monologue while they were handcuffing and beating up people at my feet. And if you think the monologue is scary to start with, try doing it while people are saying they're going to kill you and they're handcuffing them while you're doing the monologue. Can I what were you, they so uh, mad about? Yeah. Yeah. What, well, first of all, when you watch it on YouTube, are you watching the dress monologue or it's actually the one right after the melee when it's, you watch it on YouTube? It's the melee. It's surreal. Okay. What were they mad about? <laughs> they were mad because it was the beginning of my work as an AIDS field worker and as an AIDS activist. And they didn't understand, nobody understood at that time what was really happening. And they didn't know if AMFAR could be trusted or if we were against gay people or what was, they didn't really know. And so instead of waiting for an informative, intelligent conversation, they just decided, well, we'll just kill her. And it was like, it was very intense. And I went through, you know, a couple of years of, really tough times with that until we people started to really understand what we were trying to do. And um, gosh, I just, <laughs> I was so not prepared. And in those days, as you remember, the audience wasn't up like it is now. You literally ran through the audience to make your changes. And so every time we were making a change and you're really physically changing your clothes while you're running through the audience, I was just terrified. I, I honestly, I, I blacked out for half of the show. I knew part, I mean, we did that skit going through the um, airport <laughs> security. I'm sure you remember that. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah. it's all funny, but I came to for that one. I mean, I came to for like two skits. I came to for but that But for one. most of the show, I was completely blacked out with terror. I didn't even know where I was. First of all, I mean, I... Well, as you mentioned this, I remember it, but I must have been getting a wig on or something. But you're saying that Lauren Michaels actually waited in. How many were there? Like 10 people? And they must Three. have been like secret agents. They had to go in very stealthy. I don't like their know audience. how many there were, or if there were three or five or something, but it wasn't mm -hmm. a huge number of people. But it was, it was enough that Lauren was in there physically trying to contain them himself. Helping. And he told me about it at the party. He said it was, uh, you know, there was a sucker punch. Um, I, 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 I went got a for leg lock in. Um, I think that Jen Hooks had a gentleman in a headlock, and then like <laughs> Sharon landed the monologue. <laughs> it was like that. It was so. Well, really the monologue was great. I watched it. I watched it this morning, and I want to apologize publicly for the. Uh, security check sketch where I played an, <laughs> an Indian man and were convincing Sharon, her character or whatever, to take her clothes off to go through the security thing. Rob so Schneider. offensive. Just want it's it it's so 1992. <laughs> I, it, know, it's from another era. <laughs> I feel very I, you know, I don't have as many. Um, I know the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony. <laughs> and I think that we were all committing misdemeanors because we didn't think that they were there was something wrong then. We didn't have this sense. I had much bigger problems than that. You know what I mean? That yeah. was funny to me. I didn't care. I was fine being the butt of the joke. But I I 
I feel like now we're in such a weird and precious time where because people have spent too much time alone. Mm -hmm. People don't know how to be funny and intimate and or any of these things with each other. Mm -hmm. And everybody's so afraid that they're putting up such barriers around everything that people can't be normal with each other anymore. It's lost all sense of reason. We need real laws so that we know what's a felony, what's a misdemeanor, and what's an offense to me. Mm. And, and you can say, I'm offended. No, that's against the law. Mm. You know, we need to know. Uh, and the fact that we don't know has a lot of people who shouldn't be making up things, making them up. Well, as a comedian, you do self-censor yourself. Or if you're sitting around with friends and you're kind of laughing, thinking of stuff, you go, oh, you can't say that or you can't say that, or you can't do that. You just automatically get into that zone where, you know, obviously for me, when I was doing the Indian character, and I actually have an Indian cardiologist who's famous, and whenever I do events for him, he wants me to do him. Uh, <laughs> there, there was no malice in it. There was no sense of, it was really me rhythmically trying to get laughs. So I just want to say that watching it, it is comedy needs a straight person and you were perfect in it. You were completely sincere and you made us funny because you're like, oh, come on, guys, really? And then, all right, but this is the last one. So the idea that you were blacked out in that, you know, but no, she woke up for that one. Oh, you woke up for that one. I usually woke up when people start asking me to take my clothes off. <laughs> I have a tendency to wake up for that. <laughs> These buzzwords, take off your blouse. Yeah. Yeah. That whole show was really fun. Pearl Jam. Um, oh my God. I remember I just started and we were looking forward to going, oh my God, Sharon Stone and Pearl Jam coming up. Can you imagine like, what a beautiful, I mean, that's a beautiful memory. Well, we all loved hanging out with you. And you had a uh, a wing woman who was incredibly nice, too. I'm sorry, I forget her name. Or probably your best friend. But she was there all week, too. Mimi. Excuse me? Mimi. Yeah. Who's incredibly nice. And the two of you were so charming and nice. And it was, it was just fun. Um, it was a fun show for me having you out there and I don't know, just, I thought you were great. Oh, it's really fun. I'd, I'd love to do it again. Um, you know, Lauren always says, Oh, you're welcome back anytime because I think that he wants to make it up to me that I can come <laughs> on the show and no one will try to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had death squads before, but, uh, Sharon was the first. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, no, sorry, we love Lauren, but you can't, Lauren is a singularity of a human being and with a gigantic brain and a gigantic heart, but we can't not do him because he's so fun to inhabit that attitude. David, did you have something to say? I was just saying that early in my, uh, um, days when I was 21, I did a, uh, my first movie with Sharon and she was had a part in it and she couldn't have been more stunning and I couldn't have been more starstruck and she wasn't even a star <laughs> and she was so lovely on it. I was a skateboarder in it. And aside Two things I remember from that movie, Sharon was in my same apartment complex, the where they put us up. And when she was wrapped a little earlier than me, she gave me all her stuff from her apartment in her fridge, which I <laughs> took. And and because uh, I blew all my per diem at the uh, strip club. And then this is in Toronto. And then the other thing I remember is when I was at the rap party, I thirstily went to the rap party and uh I went and I had a headache before I went. So I went and bought their version of Tylenol, which is two twenty twos, which are just all codeine. It's like taking four Vicodin. <laughs> so I started getting feeling better at the party. Then I said, I think I'm going to go home. Then I said, I think I'm going to sprint home. And it was about three miles. Then I was going to dig a pool. And then I was just running around Toronto all night because I didn't know why I was so wired. And I didn't put together that they're, they're over the counter coating, yeah. which is why I want to move back. <laughs> That's a long story. I think I still have a bottle of that in my medicine cabinet. Uh, oh my God. It was so great. I couldn't believe it. Then I was like, oh wait, <laughs> I'm going to be the first one to get addicted. That'll be my goal. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Sharon was lovely. And then when she came on SNL, it was very fun for me because I was just a new writer, but I thought she went up on a rocket ship and she was doing great. And she was perfectly sweet to everyone there for being that level of craziness. Like you can't even imagine that whirlwind and then just had a real fun week with us. 
I went home and when I got in the airport, Mimi went to get the luggage so I could go and get in the limo. And while she was gone, these two, we used, there used to be a guy called the Kamikaze Paparazzi. <laughs> and he and his friend, they dove, the limo driver got out to put the bags in the back of the car and they dove in the front of the driver's seat and started screaming like they were like warriors on crack or something and were coming through the space to the back seat, taking pictures of me while they were screaming at the top of their lungs. It was so crazy. And the driver had to pull them out and he started beating them up to get them out of the car. <laughs> And then we got the old the car days. and we started down the freeway and they started behind us and they kept hitting the limo with their car. They kept rear ending us and side swiping us. And it was so terrifying. And I kept, I got the police on the phone and the police are like, well, stop, stop the car because we don't know which town from the airport to my house you're in. And I'm like, I'm not going to mm -hmm. stop the car. They keep hitting me. They're hitting me. I'm terrified to stop the car because I don't know what they'll do to me. And they're like, well, we don't know how to help you because you're moving. You're a moving target. And I'm like, I think you better get a helicopter because they're ramming the shit out of our car. And <laughs> that used to be legal. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I think now about these young superstars like Taylor Swift and stuff, like yeah. how did she get from one place to the next safely? I think that there's a lot of security that's never discussed because it, it has to be a small army and very stealthy. It has to be 24-7. But, you know, when this happened to me, the studios weren't going to pay me more money and they weren't going to pay for an army of security. And I, I didn't make the money to pay for it myself because they weren't paying women. And... It was a freaking nightmare. I mean, helicopters in my backyard and just fucking craziness. And no one seemed to think there was a reason to give me the money to take care of myself. And yet there was a reason to keep pushing me out there. Were you dating back then? Are we married? That, that's another thing. It's hard to keep secret. I was dating... Uh, I don't, not during Basic Instinct, but I met uh, my boyfriend at the time, Bob Wagner, on The Quick and the Dead, and we were together for several years, which which was very helpful. Mm. Very helpful. Oh, we had one question. We don't know. This is an actor question. Uh, why is Michael Douglas so good at playing <laughs> guilty, horny men who are <laughs> succumbing to seductive women? Fatal Attraction, Basic Instinct, and Disclosure. What is the secret sauce? Because no one <laughs> looks more guilty <laughs> more <laughs> than Michael. Uh, but you, you two were great in the in the Basic Instinct. Now, You're being he you is were such a smart yeah. person, and. I think he really knows what works and what will work and what won't work. And he's a fantastic producer, you know, and he's also a fantastic activist. He, he really has a sense of the world and how it works and what's happening and what isn't happening. And I think he picks projects that he knows how to handle and how to make them work and how to make them sell. And I think he's, you know, he's, he said to me when I when I came on to do this show, he said, you got the best part. The villain is the best part. You can, because you don't have to follow any rules at all. You can do whatever you want. You can play mm. it the way you feel like it, and you can do anything at any time because a villain doesn't have to be consistent or dependable in any way. You can just do anything at any time, and you don't have to explain why you're doing it. And I think yeah. it's a really good hook on that. So when he plays the unlikable person, he just lets it go. Hmm. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, you two were so good together in that. And uh, he's great also. He's great. I think everything. it's Verhoeven. He's falling down. Too, really. You know, Verhoeven's a fantastic director. And he's not afraid of the perverse or the kinky or the strange. You know, he mm -hmm. just really not afraid. Yeah, yeah, basic instinct goes some places that are definitely at that time, or maybe even today, just interesting, psychosocial, not even sexual, but just sort of 
people that are damaged or whatever you want to call it. No, like when he did RoboCop and he had the robot screen turn off, it was the first yeah. time that a movie went black to see how long an audience could sit in the theater with a black screen and have it mm. be meaningful and have the audience mm -hmm. consume that empty space as part of their own journey. I mean, he takes a lot of risks and, you know, I think it might've been, there was, I don't know, but another one of his movies where he started using humans as a bullet shield and no one had done that before. And it was considered so out there, mm -hmm. you know, and we look at what we see now, you know, is so nothing. We've come a long way. That's great. Did you? <laughs> did you? Okay. <laughs> Don't underestimate the perversiveness of America. That's the big lesson. There's it's like not, they always oh, want It's more. a lesson now, isn't it? Yeah. It's nothing like a human shield. I have a question for her. <laughs> it uh, absorbs Dana. the bullets. I have a question too. You go okay, ahead. Okay. You go. Okay. Well, the quick one is. It, 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 Margot Robbie is sort of in your situation now. W would would Barbie be something that you would have been interested in? Uh, is that up your alley? That kind of movie. I went to the studio to try to make Barbie in the nineties. Bingo. With another a producer a friend of mine, and I had uh, the then uh, I guess he was the CEO of Mattel uh, on our side, and I literally we got thrown out of the studio. They were like, why would you take this American icon and want to destroy it? Like, what is wrong with you? I mean, I got a lecture and an escort to the door. Do you run into them, to them today and just go, guys, oh, they're I not, told you. They're not there anymore. You know? oh, okay. <laughs> but um, I think, uh, you know, if they're still alive, they probably think, oh, I hate her. <laughs> <laughs> Was That's it going to be, what What kind of angle would you take on a Barbie back then? I wouldn't even think of what to do with, know what to do. Well, I mean, we had it so that the opening scene would be Barbie pulling up to Mattel in her Barbie car and then Secret Service come out and their feet are as big as the car and they escort her into Mattel and it, everybody just falls aside because she's the most important member of Mattel and how all the big people are chasing her around and kissing her ass because she's the queen of Mattel and about the power of being Barbie and what Barbie could do in the world because she was so powerful. But it, wow. Well, it, it Barbie, you were ahead of your time. No, they didn't think Barbie should be powerful. The men were behind the times then. <laughs> keep Barbie in the dream car or whatever. Yeah. In her Barbie dream car. And keep her quiet. Yeah. And Ken, <laughs> so the quick and the the quick and the dead, which is a movie I love westerns. Uh, Gene Hackman, Russell Crowe before he was Russell Crowe. You were a producer on the movie. Mm -hmm. I know you fought for him, and then Leonardo DiCaprio as a fetus. He's like fifteen or something. He's seventeen. He turned 18, seventeen. Eighteen on our movie. And didn't you insist on him or pay his salary? I don't know. I read stuff that. Um, about your relationship with those two actors, Russell Crowe and Leonardo DiCaprio. I really believed in, I really did believe in both of them. I, I felt that both of them were sort of teed up to become major stars. I, I thought they were both very unusually talented and in specific ways. And, um, you know, there's a pattern in filmmaking, right? And I thought that Russell was like the Richard Burton of his time that he was, you know, that actor who could play, you know, the captain of a ship, the, you know, he had that heavy masculinity. And that was sort of fading out in that period when we had, oh, I think there was a name for it then. It was different. It was like men were kind of, I don't know, there was a name for it where men could be. Metrosexual. Oh, that's what it was. Metrosexual. And Russell yeah, was certainly not metrosexual. Russell no. was very, you know, old school man. And I felt there was a place for that in our industry. I felt this way about Ken Watanabe, that he mm. was a big place for him in film. And, you know, I just, I, I see different actors and I think, oh, you've really got it. Mm. I just met a, a guy named Aaron Pierre. And I feel certain that this guy, Aaron Pierre, is going to be a gigantic star. 
just gi- just gigantic. I think he's just going to explode in stardom. He's what, what is his type? What does he look like? Is he a, is a Russell Crowe or is he a? He just has played Malcolm X in the upcoming limited series about Malcolm X. Oh, okay. And he's he's a big, kind of strong looking. Uh, has a, just a beautiful elocution. He's got a certain way about him. He carries something mm-hmm. that just, to me, screams stardom. I think he's really going to be a, just a huge star. Huge. Okay. Um, we will have you back on our podcast in yeah. uh, in we'll a year. We'll track it, and we're gonna we're gonna talk all about that guy. One thing about Russell Crowe, I just wanted to say is because I do voices, he like he has a next level deep voice uh, and a and a big deep voice and one of my favorite movies i don't know if you guys have seen it master and commander that peter weir did with russell crowe playing the commander yeah. dry shot numbers dry shot guns and it's really hard to do him because he's like obama it's a, it's a tonally mm-hmm. uh, but and leonardo just um obviously he's just aged into this incredible actor and he looks so so young in the quick and the dead and he was he but was, uh, boy is he but great he was so infested and he was so um able to access his vulnerability and the other kids that came in were really good i mean matt damon came in for the part and he was so good so good but yeah, he's a stud. but leo came in and he he cried when his father rejected him, when Gene Hackman rejected him. Leo was the only one that cried and wanted his dad, wanted his dad to notice him and care about him. And and he was trying so hard to be enough of a man that his father would pay attention to him, which was really the crux of the character and the crux of the development. And when he was going to die and couldn't get it. He just, you know, he was crying for his father's attention and affection. And it was so profoundly moving and so brave for a 17-year-old kid to come in on an audition and let that out. And I, I just thought, that kid has a lot going on and he is going a long ways because not any other person came in and we saw everybody in the town, not every, anybody else that came in was willing to just rip it open like that. And that's why I, I stood up for him because I thought, you know, you have a kind of guts in your vulnerability that is what makes the star. And that combination of intense courage with your own vulnerability is so rare. And he just has it in spades. I mean, that's why you see him in the Wolf of Wall Street and he just lets it rip, you know? And he's not embarrassed or ashamed or uh, pulling his punches, you know? And that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. yeah. He's a good movie star, mm-hmm. you know? And you were saying Sidney Portier earlier. I was wondering. I'm sure there are, but it doesn't seem like there's as many of those old school, elegant, great looking, cool movie stars like there used to be. There probably is. But I think when you grow up with a certain ones that you look up to, you, it feels like they're, it's thinning a bit. Yeah, I think this 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 kid, this he doesn't look like a kid, but he uh, is young. This Aaron Pierre has that. I think he has that elegance. And you're right. It is so rare because for some reason, young people seem to have this kind of disregard and disrespect for the way they appear in public and the way they treat the press as though the press isn't your sole liaison to the public. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, get a clue. If they don't want to shoot you and they don't want to support you and they don't want to believe in your films, you should probably leave town. Hmm. <laughs> I love the idea of leaving town still. You know, <laughs> Get out of town. With all our connectivity. Can we talk about Casino for a second? Because I, I I was talking to my wife about that. She goes, oh my God, Sharon was so brilliant in that movie. Because I guess it's the actress meets the part, meets the director, 
meets De Niro and meets Pesci. And that was magic in that role. It was my dream. Uh, my whole dream was to work with Robert De Niro. I, my acting teacher is like, what do you really want out of this? And I'm like, I <laughs> to work opposite Robert De Niro and hold my own. I mean, that was the whole sentence. That was the whole thing. That's really all I ever wanted. And I got it. I didn't expect I was going to get to work with Martin Scorsese, you know, Jesus, who does, you know, mm -hmm. and to have had this astonishing opportunity and to get to do it, you know, I wasn't going to leave anything on the floor. You didn't. Uh, you did what's, not. What's De Niro like? Like you're in a scene with him between takes, just, just casual. I just love to know, like, does he change it a lot? Does he surprise you? What, what's it like? You're just doing a scene with De Niro. He Scorsese's doesn't there. mess around on set. He doesn't small mm -hmm. talk. He doesn't hang out. He doesn't have anything else to talk to you about other than the work of the day. Nothing. N absolutely nothing else. And um, he might give me a suggestion, but he doesn't tell me how to do my job. He would might say, you know, in the middle of that thing you're doing, could you just give me a glance here at some point? Mm. Or do you need something here from me? Or is this what you, are you wanting this? You know, he's just, he's very, very connected to the work, the outcome, what you're doing. He's just absolutely the most dedicated, devoted. Watching him work, I learned more than I learned watching any other actor. And I got to work with like, George C. Scott. I mean, I worked with some really wow. cool actors. You know what I mean? But De Niro is, uh, you know, he's just like his own thing, man. You know, he's not a chit chatter. He's just really is serious. And that's the reason I think he's so good. And what about Pesci? <laughs> Joe Pesci really fought for me. You know, he fought for me to get the part. He believed in me, he stood up for me. He's really good to me. Um, I really appreciate him so much. He was really supportive of me. He he absolutely believed in me in a way that I don't think anybody else really did. And um, you know, we had a lot, we had rough scenes to shoot. You know, like because mm -hmm. our relationship was rough sex and and dirty and secret and and mm -hmm. uh, I felt completely safe with him although you know when he's in that character he's scary as all you know he's you know he's all in and it's good to work with someone that's all in but you know Joey played in that film just a you know really you know I don't know how to explain it, but like loose, ready to go, ready to kill somebody at any second. Mm. And, you know, I'm playing someone who's choking me <laughs> in, in <laughs> bed and I'm trying to be loose with all this, you know. Right. You know, it's a, it's it was intense and great intense. But, you know, you got to belly up to the bar when you go to work with Jimmy Woods and Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro there's no fucking around. Mm -hmm. You better be good. You got to hold your own. You better be present. Mm -hmm. And I think that those people often scare actresses. I've watched many, many other actresses work. And while they're sometimes quite good, often they seem a bit defended. Mm. And I think that you have to really not be separate from those guys. You have to be willing to jump in the pool with them and know that they're not going to save you if you're drowning. Before we let you get on with your life, I just wanted to kind of mention your book, um, your autobiography, which got rave reviews. Do you want to talk to it a little bit or... Um, and then also your art. And right now you're in... And in Berlin, in a gallery, I believe, <laughs> uh, you your art has been well received by critics. You've been interviewed 
in New York by Jerry Stass or whatever. So Jerry Saltz. Wh- how how did that mm-hmm. happen? And what are you? Um, they're big, beautiful, colorful abstracts. Are they in acrylic or oil or a combo? And do you have someone helping you bring in canvases and stretch them and gesso them? And th- there's a industrial part of having a studio. And how did you work toward being able to do that? Or, or you'd done <laughs> some art before, but I, it's a, I'm just curious. Yeah, you know, I studied all this in university where, you know, if you studied art, you had to do everything from jewelry making to sculpting to oils, watercolors, acrylic, you had to do everything, everything, everything. Mm -hmm. Um, So I know how to do all that, but there's certain aspects of it I just don't want to do anymore. So I get my canvases stretched for me and I get them built elsewhere Mm because it's just, it's too much for me at this point. Um, But I do have a studio manager who is really cool named Zach and he's uh, terrific and he helps me a, a lot. Um, and, but basically, I mean, painting is sort of a one man band and you've got to just, it takes time. It takes time and dedication and devotion and you, it's an on the job learning process. And the more you paint, the better you get and the more you understand and the more you study, the more you understand how to mix colors and the more you understand how color works. I'm fascinated by color. And the more you understand balance and story and execution and the use of all the different possible tools that you can use, it's like anything. The more you mm-hmm. do it, the better you get. And do you work on multiple canvases at a time or do you kind of yes, want to? I, I, I do. I have, well, I work on Ooh. canvas till I feel that it's at the point where I'm as far as I can go. And sometimes I complete a canvas. And sometimes I think that's the underpainting. And I need to just put that in the other room for now until mm-hmm. I understand where I'm going from here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that I'm totally makes sense. Right. Cause you guys probably write like that. Right. Yeah. And Dana paints also. Well, I paint, I, yeah, but I'm not, not like you, but I, I was surprised how much I loved it and I have no ability at all. I would just do doodles and little characters on yellow pads, right? And then I saw Basquiat, and I go, "Oh, well, I'll do I'll do my version of that." So I do them on heavy paper, thirty by thirty-two, and then sometimes I blow them up, and they're just uh, acrylic, so I can go fast. I don't want to think too much, and I often overpaint them. I think overpainting is is smart and good. I overpaint constantly. I think you don't want to waste anything. And when you know it's not working, overpaint it or overpaint part of it, which is what I'm coming to understand now is that when you do something and you think, oh, that's just awful, don't just overpaint the whole thing right away. Like give yourself a minute to really step back from it and find one good thing in it and start Mm -hmm. overpainting, but leave the good thing. And before you overpaint it, make sure you turn it every single direction. (laughs) Turn it upside down, turn it sideways, look at it from every direction, because you don't know where your inspiration is coming from. And Mm -hmm. I agree. I think Basquiat is just the unbelievable talent. And Mm -hmm. he also showed us another way to be, another way to express ourselves, another opportunity. You know, it, you, you'd look at it and you go, why is it affecting me so much? When you go to an art museum and you're going around the corner, you see a big Basquiat. Because you go, people, it, you can't dismiss it. There's something um, so fluid about it, so casual. You, this feeling of just being connected to the canvas. It, I, I don't know. It's just talent, I guess. <laughs> but he's, he's fun. Uh, who else do you like? <laughs> well, you know, with this Rothko show that has been going on, and then if you follow the show, then mm-hmm. you start getting your daily Rothko. And you, it's just, you look at these colors and you think, The same thing. Why is this having such a tremendous impact on me? And how Mm -hmm. did he do it and why? And what does it mean? And it just, it just evokes so much. And, you know, I feel this way. I'm a huge Gerard Richter fan. And I feel, I just love these paintings and the impact and movement of these paintings. And, you know, uh, Helen Frankenthal, the color, the color aspect of what she did was so mm-hmm. 
moving and interesting. And the way she did it was all her own. And I just, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I'm a little bit of an artaholic. I've spent most of my life on the road um, in museums on my day off. And mm. that's been a, a fantastic education. Well, um, it's cool. You've been, it, it, it is, uh, it's a little bit like any kind of personal pursuit, like time really flies. If you're really focused on a painting, whether you're a novice or great, it's, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a meditation mm -hmm. and, uh, you're, you've been really well received. So I, um, I'm going to make a prediction about you, whether, whether mm -hmm. you want it or not, but some, there's going to be some role or live streaming Apple show or something you're going to be in and be brilliant. Um, if you, if you feel like you want that, cause I can just tell talking to you, put the camera on this woman cause you have <laughs> all this energy <laughs> and all this emotion. Uh, it's all right there. So that's my prediction. You have yours, David, would you like to make a prediction? <laughs> I think it was, it's wonderful talking to Sharon. She's so articulate and so, uh, exactly as i remember and she's got such a voice that is very unique and uh well known and uh and voices never change with people it's always you know you get older and people go on their lives and it's always there's something interesting about somebody's voice it's like a fingerprint i like hearing sharon's voice i like hearing all she has to say today and uh very cool of her to to talk to us. Um, Thank you for great coming time. on, Sharon. Really, really enjoyed it. We're I wish so, you all the best. I was so excited that you asked me to come on. Um, first, because I haven't seen either one of you in quite a while, and it's just good <laughs> to see you both. And it's good to see you both well and good. And <laughs> yeah. it's good to see that, you know, we're all still standing. You know, we devoted ourselves and agreed to do this. And you know, it's it's hard to hold on. You have to yeah. really want it. It has to be everything to you to hold on. And and it's it's really nice to see that we're all still surviving together. So I just really appreciate that you took your time and invited me into your world. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. All right, Sharon. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. And thank you. And have a great day. This has been a presentation of Odyssey. Please follow, subscribe. Leave a like, a review, all the stuff, smash that button, whatever it is, wherever you get your podcasts. Fly on the Wall is executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Jenna Weiss Berman of Odyssey, Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment, and Heather Santoro. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman. <laughs>